I live near a healing spring. It's famous around the world. You may have heard of it, and then again, maybe not. It's a well-known tourist trap about half an hour away from my house by car, so I can go there anytime I like. Others have spent their entire lives saving up, dreaming of going there, hoping to heal their terminal illness or broken body after hearing a story on the news or on a website. And it works. Not all the time, of course, but every once in a while, someone steps into the little lake, comes out completely healed. X-rays and CAT scans, MRIs and ultrasounds, they confirm the impossible. The doctors will even tell them, this is a miracle. The church will be notified, and it gets put into writing that a person was supernaturally healed. These types of documented events are extremely rare. Each miracle is closely followed up on, and if the healing isn't permanent, it is no longer considered a miracle. But that's never happened, to my knowledge. Whatever goes on down there under the murky mineral water, it sticks. The thing is, I've always been suspicious of the world-famous healing spring. The church is so secretive about it, they refuse to allow any scientific experiments to be done on the water or the soil there. This despite the fact that everything from cancer to MS to bone degeneration have been cured by the mystery of water. They've owned the land for centuries. I've asked once to take some scuba gear into the water, try to run some tests, and they refuse vehemently. Even under supervision, they won't allow any sort of exploration. Security guards patrol the shore, and bags are inspected upon entering, so there's no way to sneak any equipment in there during the day when the place is open. But I thought of another way. I suppose I should explain why I'm so curious. Why don't just believe the priests when they say it's simply God healing the sick with his divine power? I believe that's possible, mind you, but that's not what's happening here. When I was eight years old, we went to visit the healing spring with my uncle. He had suffered from Parkinson's disease for years, and my family thought that maybe he could be cured through the divine power of the healing pool. His entire body was shaking as he stepped into the water with tentative, quivering strides. But when he emerged from the pale blue lake, he was a different man. As he swam into the deepest part of the water, I saw his head go under and his eyes widened in surprise. It looked to my young eyes like someone had grabbed him by the ankle and pulled him under. When he came back up, he looked different. He came forth from the beach on sturdy legs, his gait sure and purposeful. I saw him walk right up to my mother and look her dead in the eyes, his face slack and expressionless. I'm fixed, he said with a total lack of joy or enthusiasm. Let's leave this place. As he spoke, I thought to myself, this man is not my uncle anymore. But of course my mom refused to believe it. She figured he was the same old Uncle Dan, only healed. I told her that Uncle Dan was in trouble. He was still at the bottom of the lake. This new man, the new Uncle Dan, said not to be silly. That he was standing right there in front of me. But when he spoke, his eyes flashed with something evil and full of hate for me for having spoken. They flickered a pale blue for a second, like a second eyelid blinking sideways and then returned to Brown. He winked at me and smiled, and I saw his tongue now looked far too big for his mouth. It was bunched up and folded over, crammed into his maw like dinner leftovers in a bowl too small to hold them all. His yellow, smoke-stained teeth were now white as snow, and he grinned widely, showing them to me. I tried to tell myself it was just my imagination. But I knew it was true. I, I was just lying to myself because I was scared. Who am I kidding? I was fucking petrified. The new Uncle Dan was not a nice man. Whereas my old Uncle Dan had sung and joked and danced on his wobbly legs, this man was serious, mean, and quick to anger. 
If I dropped something or took too long to get him a drink. He was always thirsty now. He would turn bright red and scream at me in a deep and terrible voice. Hurry up, you little shit! What the fuck is taking your stupid ass so long? He would yell and scream and curse. He never joked anymore, but before that he'd always had a joke or two. My mom stopped visiting him after a few months, and then pretty soon they barely spoke. But she never admitted I had been right. She stubbornly insisted that this doppelganger, this imposter, was still her brother. He had to be. I knew she was wrong. And worse yet, I had a feeling, a very overwhelming inkling, that Uncle Dan was still down at the bottom of that lake. It was like he was calling out to me for help from down there. If I could only find his body, I could prove that this other man wasn't really him, that he had simply stolen my uncle's life. So one night, many years later, when I was in my late twenties, full of pride and fearlessness, I made my way over to the property. I had all my gear, my flippers, wetsuit, air tank, regulator, hoses, a waterproof camera, flashlight, everything else I needed. I had been preparing for years to do this. I drove past the gated entrance a little way down the road and parked in the tall grass. I got out of my car and made my way through the forest towards the little lake. The night sky was clear and cloudless. A full moon shone up above and lit my path as I walked through the brush. I had to hide once or twice when I saw the flashlight beams of security guards patrolling the area, but kept moving again once they had passed by. I slipped through the woods as quickly and quietly as I could, making my way towards the healing pool further within the property. The security guards were everywhere. Dozens of them. Why did they need such protection for a little lake, I wondered. It only convinced me further that something sinister was happening here. After a few close calls, once nearly walking right into a guard and only avoiding detection just barely, I reached the water's edge. The surface was still in black, reflecting a mirror image of the stars and moon above. I saw something move in the water and then it disappeared a second later. Probably just a fish or a frog, I thought to myself. I put on my equipment, still hiding at the edge of the forest next to the water. After a few moments of gathering my courage, I stepped in. It was thick with minerals and difficult to see, even through my mask. I took out my flashlight and turned it on. The visibility was still poor, but slightly better now. I kicked my legs and was propelled forward into the depths, my flippers making the work easy. I'm not sure what I was expecting to find down there, but I definitely wasn't expecting what I saw next. Those look like giant figs, I remember thinking to myself. Have you ever eaten a fig? You know when you cut one open and inside are all those tiny little alien-looking finger hairs? Like cilia on a microscopic cell, but larger. They group together like a mouth in the middle. That's what I saw. There were dozens of them, and they dotted the floor of the lake. They opened up like flowers blooming as I approached, and at the center of each large fig mouth was a white bulb the size of a cantaloupe. They appeared to be plants growing on the bottom of the lake, but they were massive, over 15 feet tall. I had never seen anything like them before in my life. They were purple and gold, alien-looking, and moved as if they were alive. As I got closer, I saw strange vines as well, coiled like snakes at the base of each plant. I swam down to look and saw they were moving around like snakes. The white bulb at the center of the plant closest to me moved suddenly. I was far too close to it. I realized too late, my heart pounding with fear. The white, round thing rotated downwards. And I saw what looked like eyes staring at me from it. I couldn't pry my eyes away, despite my rising terror. I looked closer and realized whose eyes they were. It was Uncle Dan. Only his face was now pale and bloated. His brown eyes were wide and afraid, just as they had looked that day when he went under the water and disappeared, 
almost 20 years before. His entire body was enveloped in the cilia of the mouth. He looked like he had been swallowed alive by the disgusting purple fig plant. The little finger hairs moved around his head and wriggled with sudden activity. They fluttered up and down and seemed to draw him back in as he struggled. His head wriggled and squirmed and I saw he was still fighting to get free. Uncle Dan was alive. Nearly two decades later, he was still alive. I saw his bloated face was covered in fibrous plant material which made it impossible for him to scream or open his mouth. The plant was feeding him oxygen and nutrients, I realized. It was keeping him alive, but why? I felt something wrapping itself around my ankle and looked down with increasing fear. I was pulled down suddenly and I saw a long vine and it snared my leg like a boa constrictor. Not good. Not good at all. I looked and saw it was pulling me in towards the open mouth of one of the giant purple figs. This one looked younger, slightly smaller. I got the feeling when it got me in its clutches it would hold me in its terrifying mouth forever, just like in my Uncle Dan. And not only that, but there would suddenly be a new me created, a meaner, thirstier me. My thoughts raced and I suddenly remembered my knife. I managed to grab it as the vine dug deeper into my leg. I could feel it squeezing my bones and crushing my body tissues with its powerful grip. I reached down and slashed at the vine with my blade, cutting shallow gashes into the tough skin of the thing. Its grip stayed firm and it didn't relent. With increasing horror, I realized it was wrapping itself even more tightly around my ankle and squeezing tighter and tighter. I began to feel pins and needles in my foot. I reached down again, and this time I tried to saw at the blade, running my knife back and forth quickly and ineffectively as panic began to take hold of me. Fear swelled and grew within me as I saw the monstrous plant was now very close, its alien mouth opening and closing, the cilia moving around with anticipation as if the thing were licking its lips with hunger. This one did not have a white bulb at its center. It wanted me for that coveted place. I sawed with my knife harder and quicker, my heart beating fast and heavy in my chest, loud enough I could hear it in my ears. The pain in my leg was incredible. The thing felt like it was made of stone. I hacked and dug with the pointed tip of the blade and tried fruitlessly to gain purchase on the writhing tentacle. The knife slipped and skidded painfully into my skin, causing me to wince in sudden sharp pain of another variety. Another vine came up and began to pull up my mask, trying to rip it from my face. I slashed and hacked with the knife and managed to cut off a piece of this thinner vine, and it retreated. But soon several others began to approach from the depths. This was not going well. The agony in my ankle and foot grew and grew until it became completely numb, as the pins and needles sensation went away to be replaced by a heavy pressure pain. I pictured my foot turning increasingly darker shades of purple. At that moment, I was beyond desperate. The pain in my leg was worse than anything I had ever thought possible, and my hacking and sawing at the vine was making no progress. I took a deep breath and began to saw instead at my own leg, rather than the tentacle that had ensnared it, making quick progress on the flesh below the kneecap. Compared to the vine, my leg made for easy work. The knife cut through the skin and tendon like it was a tough steak. The pain was terrible, but the idea of getting free was better, and I continued sawing, biting down on the regular mouthpiece and trying desperately to keep breathing. I reached bone and continued to saw with the serrated blade of the knife. I was making tiny bits of progress and starting to become slightly hopeful when one of the vines pulled off my face mask and another yanked the regulator out of my mouth. I managed to get one last good breath in before my air source was pulled away. I held my breath and swung the knife wildly trying to scare the tentacles off, then went back to my leg. I was through the bone. Finally. My hand continued to saw through the other side and I felt a huge weight drop off below me as my dismembered foot fell down into the depths. Kicking with my one remaining leg, I swam up to the surface. The other vines brushed against me as I escaped, but I managed to get away without any of them managing to grab onto me. I got up to the surface of the water and took huge, gasping breaths of the fresh air. My leg screamed in agony and I struggled towards the beach. When I got there, several security guards were waiting for me. 
I got the impression they had no idea what happened beneath the lake at the bottom. They were simply hired goons. Their faces regarded me with pity as I coughed up water from my lungs and screamed in agony. You lose your other leg? One of them asked dully. Luckily, they felt bad for me and dialed 911 before calling their bosses. I managed to escape from the place in the back of an ambulance and wound up in a nearby hospital on the trauma unit there. I was an inpatient for over three months. After multiple surgeries, they managed to make a stump that could be fitted for a prosthesis. The nurses and doctors were amazing, giving encouragement and support as I made my healing journey, as they called it. I guess I shouldn't laugh. It really was a trip. I worked with prostheticists and occupational therapists, physiotherapists and orthopedic surgeons, rehab specialists, and finally, finally outpatient treatment clinics. It was at one of my infrequent visits to one of these clinics recently that something happened which prompted me to write this. I was sitting on the steel table in the examination room, trying not to slide off and tumble down to the floor as the disposable paper covering slipped beneath me. The occupational therapist walked in with her student at her side. They regarded me for a moment and then looked at their clipboard together as one. Their eyes looked up at me from the clipboard, two pairs together at the same time. Their eyelids didn't close, but I saw them blink a second set of eyes. Sideways. The irises flicked pale blue for a second, and they smiled at me. What are you doing here? The occupational therapist asked me. Didn't you hear about the healing spring? It's very close. We can show you. Her long tongue slipped from her mouth as she spoke, and she poked it back in. A thick, purple and gold... Vine. I never expected the response I received to my first post about the healing spring. A lot of people commented with ideas on how to destroy the horrible place with its giant carnivorous purple fig plants. The ones living in secret on the floor of the lake. They had stolen the lives of innocent people who had come to be healed replacing them with doppelgangers. These imposters now roamed the earth angry and thirsty, full of rage, and looking to spread their vines and infect as many others as they could. I had run into two of these replacement plant people during my outpatient appointment at the prosthesis clinic. The purple fig monsters had stolen my leg, but weren't satisfied with just that, it seemed. Now they wanted the rest of my body as well. What are you doing here? The occupational therapist had asked. Didn't you hear about the healing spring? It's very close. We can show you. Her long, purple and gold vine tongue had popped briskly out of her mouth after that, and she had poked it back in with a dainty finger, the nail freshly painted in a glossy, bright pink shade. The occupational therapist and her assistant had the same telltale eyes that my uncle had possessed after being healed by the spring. There was a second pair of pale blue eyes beneath the superficial ones, and they blinked perpendicular to the first, staying closed almost all the time, only showing themselves occasionally to a select few, myself included. It was like they wanted me to know. I had slid right off the paper-covered stainless steel examination table, my mouth agape. I jumped up, terrified, and ran out of the room on my good leg and prosthesis as quickly as I could, screaming. They didn't try to stop me. Just watched, smiling. They held their clipboard and stood as still as a pair of statues, their eyes turning to watch me go. I was more terrified than I had ever been in my life my heart beating fast and hard as I backed away and hurried from the office. Let us know if you change your mind. Their voices rang out cheerily from behind me as I ran away. 
When I got home, I didn't know what to do. I typed out what had happened to me on the computer so I wouldn't forget a single detail, and as a bit of proof in case something should happen to me. By the time I was finished, I realized it read like a horror story. And what better place to share something like that, I thought. You all can decide for yourselves if it's true, I said to myself as I hit the post button. A small part of me wondered if anyone else who had witnessed the Healing Pool's curse on a loved one would read it. Surprisingly, someone did contact me, asking where the pool was located. They said they had a similar experience with one of their loved ones, and wanted to know if it was the same place. I was a little scared of giving out my location. Who knew exactly what kind of person I was dealing with? They could be a spy for the church. A plant, I thought to myself, then laughed out loud. <sighs> Fuck it. J Group. How about this? Where's the place that you're talking about? I'll confirm if it's the same one. Anonymous. The healing spring I visited with my cousin was in... Blank. J Group. Holy shit, are you fucking with me? Anonymous. N no, for real, I take it they're the same? J Group. Yeah, what the fuck? Alright. Taking a chance here call me. And I gave him my number. We ended up speaking on the phone for a while and it turned out the guy lived in a neighboring town. I know they say never to meet up with people from online, but this seemed different somehow. I got the distinct impression that he was genuine. Not only that, but he had a plan. He said he would tell me more in person and I decided to trust him, although I still arranged for it to be in a public place. We met at a coffee shop, and he waved me over from his table. So I guess you're J Group? He asked. You must be anonymous, I said. Very original, by the way. Thanks. I wish I could say the same, he half-joked, sipping his black coffee. Listen, I don't know if your story was true or not, but I tend to believe it. There's too many details that match what happened to me as a kid. The guy looked deeply troubled. He had dark circles beneath his eyes and his hair was long and greasy. The lines on his face told me that he'd been through hell and barely come out alive. What happened to you? I asked. He stared at his coffee for a few moments longer, deep in thought, before speaking. I was just a kid. My cousin wasn't much older than me. But he had a bum leg. It had been like that since he was born. He couldn't play sports, couldn't run around with the rest of us kids. My mom was a believer, and she heard about the healing spring. She said we should go up there one Saturday and bring Billy and his mom, my Aunt Kathy. Sounds familiar, I said. <laughs> yeah, right. So anyways, we get there and Billy goes out in the water. I was going to go in with him, but my mom told me I had to put my sunscreen on first. So there I am putting on my suntan lotion. My mom's getting my back for me and I'm watching Billy out there in the water. He's swimming around and splashing and I'm thinking, you know, hurry up, Mom. I want to get out there too, you know. I'm getting impatient. And that's when I see him go under. His head goes straight under like a loon going fishing. Or like someone yanked his leg and pulled him down quick like something real strong. The guy took a sip of his coffee and set it back down. He sat there for a while and looked into the pitch blackness of his drink. Took a deep breath and continued. So I told my mom, I'm going in there. To hell with the sunscreen, you know. So I run over to the edge of the water and she's yelling at me, but I don't care. I see Billy pop his head out of the water. I'm relieved at first until I get a closer look at him. And I think to myself, that ain't Billy. That's somebody else wearing a Billy suit. The man looked up at me and gave me a look as if he was waiting for me to call him a liar. What happened next? I thought my uncle was an imposter right away too. I gave him what I hoped was a solemn look. I had been through something similar and remembered how no one had believed me. Not even my own mother. I jumped in the water. Started swimming out there right past the kid. I had my goggles on and looked underneath but I couldn't see nothing. So murky under there. 
I tried to swim down, but I couldn't find him. My mom nearly had a fit, yelling, screaming at me. She kept telling me my cousin was right there. He was healed. What was I doing out swimming in the water when a miracle had just happened? Eventually, I gave up. I had to come out of there. I almost believed in myself for a little while. I tried to convince myself it was true, but I always knew deep down. He had forgotten his coffee for the time being and just looked at me, waiting to see what I would say. I believe you, first of all, I told him. I know that's not what you're used to hearing when you tell that story. At least, that's not what people said when I told them what happened to me. They called me a fucking liar and every other terrible name he can call someone. He nodded and looked down at his coffee again. We sat there in silence for a minute and I wasn't sure what to say next. But then he very hesitantly told me the main reason why he had contacted me. It took a while for him to get around to it, a lot of beating around the bush, but eventually I got it out of him. It turned out he had a plan. I listened intently for over an hour as he went through the details. He said I didn't need to decide right then and there, but I thought I should think about it. After all, this was a big decision. It could mean jail time for both of us if we were caught. I went home and had trouble sleeping that night. I tossed and turned, trying in vain to get comfortable as my non-existent limb screamed in impossible pain. When I finally dozed off, my dreams were vivid, the tension crackling in the air like static before a thunderstorm. This dark energy transformed itself into nightmares that felt indistinguishable from reality. I had always been getting nightmares these days. After the occupational therapist office, they'd gotten ten times worse. It was like the creatures at the bottom of the lake could see into my mind now. They had planted a seed of something evil in my head, which terrible, horrible visions grew from while I slept, while I was exposed. This all sounds crazy, I know. It probably is crazy. In my dream, I was at the bottom of the lake again. The plants were all around me, towering high up above me. The vines slithered like a pit of vipers all around me, and I saw I was up to my neck in them, looking out hopeless. I was being consumed by them like quicksand. I gasped for air and felt their weight on my chest and pushing the breath from my lungs as I struggled and sank deeper into the writhing, tangled mass of leathery vines. One of the giant purple fig plants leaned over from its great height and came towards me. I saw the face inside belong to my Uncle Dan. It was pale and bloated, rotten and decayed. His eyes were gone now, and small fish swam in and out of the dark hollows where they'd once been. His mouth opened, and inside it looked just like the inside of a fig. As he spoke, the little finger hair cilia vibrated and swayed. You belong here with me. Come back to the healing pool. There's a spot here next to me, Jason. It's been reserved just for you. It will take you in and make you one with it. You will not be missed from up above. Join me. I saw an eel poking its head from his eye socket and went back inside to hide in his skull. Shy. The darkness from where his eyes once were stared back at me. He continued to speak in my Uncle Dan's voice, but I could no longer comprehend the words. They were in an alien language that I had never heard before. I felt the vines crawling up my neck, then my chin, over the lips, and past the gum. Strangled breathing, here we come. Down my throat, reaching inside of me as I retched and gagged. The vines reached down my esophagus, and I felt them moving around and settling in my stomach, planting roots there. My uncle saw this and smiled at me, his mouth made of cilia that jiggled in delight as he watched my terror grow. I woke up panting, covered in cold sweat. My heart was beating heavily in my chest. The dark room around me was full of malicious-looking shadows. One of these shadows looked like a person standing over me. And I turned on the bedside lamp, terrified. There in my room, a priest in a long, purple robe stood over my bed. He had been waiting there in the darkness, watching me sleep. His eyes were pale blue, and he had a small, humorless grin on his face. He gripped a long staff in his left hand and he lifted it up and then brought it back down to the floor with a loud bang. A vine crept from his mouth an inch towards me. 
and I found I couldn't move. His pale blue eyes watched me as they blinked irregularly from side to side. I looked and saw my hands and feet were bound tightly with purple and gold vines. They dug into my skin painfully, crushing my bones. The vine from the priest's mouth came towards me, more and more quickly, its face now that of a king cobra. It came at me suddenly, bolting straight at my face and my mouth open as I screamed. I opened my eyes and realized, as I did, that it had been a false awakening. The second dream had been even more terrifying than the first, and they had both felt entirely too real. I made up my mind then. We would go through with the crazy son of a bitch's plan. I only hoped he knew what he was doing. After my most recent pair of horrifying nightmares, I resolved to call Bill the guy I had met on Reddit. He told me his plan, a way to kill the monsters at the bottom of the lake, and I believed it could work. The giant purple fig plants had ruined too many lives, had stolen too many souls, and we were going to try to set things right. After a brief talk on the phone, he told me the location where we would meet, a small airfield north of town. He would be waiting for me at the gates and would take me inside, using his ID badge to get past security. His plane was kept there, a small, single-engine Cessna. I had only been on a plane a few times before and was afraid of heights, so I was more than a little scared. But I tried to ignore my fears as I pulled up behind his car outside the airfield. He brought us in and took us to his plane. It was already late in the evening, but for what we had planned, we wanted the cover of darkness. So we took our time getting set up. The plane was already rigged with what he described as hell in a barrel, a concoction he said would kill any living thing. It was like dropping a neutron bomb in the water. Any biological life would cease to exist. I wondered if my doppelganger uncle and the real version of him at the bottom of the lake would die as well. I guessed that they would. For the former, I was gleeful at the idea, the latter not so much. But at least Uncle Dan would finally have peace. He would be free of his purgatory of pain at the bottom of the lake. And for that I was thankful. Once we were up in the air, it didn't take long to reach the airspace above the healing pool. Bill told me he worked as a crop duster, and as such he knew his chemicals. This stuff would do the trick, he told me, as he pushed the button to release the toxic cocktail into the black water below us. A trail of yellow-green dust and smoke hung in the air behind the plane as we passed over the starlit surface of the healing pool. With the deed done, he banked the plane around and began heading back towards the airfield, careful to keep a wide berth around the chemical cloud still hanging in the air. Yeah, boy, we did it! He yelled at the top of his lungs. I tried to match his enthusiasm but failed miserably and the interior of the plane was quiet again. Why did he even want me to come along? I couldn't help but ask myself. Couldn't he have done this on his own? I don't feel like I did a whole lot, I said to him. Well, you were the one who made me realize for sure what happened to my cousin, so I'm glad you're here. I might have done this in a day or two anyways if I'd gotten the courage up, but that's not a sure thing. I can't tell you why, but it helped having you along for the ride, so thanks. Billy and your Uncle Dan are free now, man. At least they will be in an hour or two. I paused and thought about that for a second. What do you mean? I asked. Well, I mean, it's not instantaneous, I guess. He gulped. I, I didn't think about it that much before. He seemed a bit nervous suddenly. So if it's not immediate... How much pain are they going to experience? Are they going to suffer? I asked him. He was starting to look a bit red in the face. Uh, well, from what I've read, it's not pretty. I mean, who knows how they'll be affected with the weird plant biology going on down there, but yeah, it could get kind of ugly. What's kind of ugly? I asked. He's been through a lot already. He still feels pain, I'm, I'm sure of that. 
well, I'm not a scientist or anything, but I guess the best way to describe it would be that their insides would become their outsides. He spoke slowly and haltingly. I pictured my uncle's flesh being sucked inward and replaced by the dark, sanguineous tissue and blood vessels from within. So we just made my uncle Dan turn inside out. Perfect. Just fucking perfect. Suddenly there was a deafening explosion. I felt heat on the back of my head and then the cool night air rushed in and I saw the stars above us through a jagged, growing gap in the fiberglass ceiling of the plane. I looked back and saw the entire tail of the Cessna was gone, torn free and flying through the air behind us, disappearing to the darkness of the night sky. We were spiraling downwards from our low altitude. I screamed and swore as my stomach lurched and the ground came up at us through the windshield. The plane careened off the side of a large evergreen tree and crashed, spinning sickeningly towards the pine needle strewn floor of the forest. My heart was beating wildly in my chest as I unbuckled my seatbelt. I couldn't believe I was still alive. Bill was breathing rapid, shallow breaths beside me. Somehow we had both survived the crash. The low altitude of the plane and the tree branches we had crashed through had been our saving grace. And I saw the side of Bill's face. He had a long gash down his cheek and his eye was pinkish purple and closed shut. His leg had a piece of shrapnel in it as well, I noticed. He was bleeding heavily from multiple places. I managed to climb out of my seat and help Bill out of the burning plane. He was taking rasping breaths and wincing with pain at each step we took. It didn't look like he could walk very far. The fire was getting larger and I pulled him away from the burning wreckage of it. The trees above were starting to catch fire as well, I saw. We stumbled away from the inferno and I put Bill's arm over my shoulder to help him walk like a human crutch. He bounced on his good leg and the other one bled and dripped glistening crimson that reflected the firelight eerily when I looked back at it. The forest swallowed us up and we made our way into its depths. I had been here before and had seen so many guards everywhere. The last thing I wanted was to run into them again. The last time they'd found me with a decapitated leg and had called for an ambulance for me. I got the feeling they wouldn't be so forgiving this time. I saw flashlights in the distance and pulled Bill the other way, deeper into the woods. Hobbling along, we eventually found a place to hide. A small cave that was concealed by some brush. It was almost invisible and we were in no condition to run any further. Bill could barely move. We would just have to hope they couldn't find us. We would have to wait until morning to make our escape. Inside the cave there was enough space for us to stretch out and lie down. We couldn't really relax with the guards looking for us outside, but we managed to settle in and rest for a while. My eyes eventually fluttered shut for a moment and Bill's did the same. I had nightmares once again. Horrible visions of death and destruction on the bottom of the lake where I resided with the plants amid the slithering mass of snake-like vines. I dreamt the lake had been brought up to a boil, and I watched in terror as my skin blanched and peeled, swelled, and fell to pieces. My sleep didn't last very long, and I sat bolt upright trying desperately not to scream. When I woke up, there were three priests looming over us wearing long, hooded vermilion robes. Their faces were enshrouded in darkness. I elbowed Bill and he sat up and rubbed his eyes, then recoiled in surprise at the sight of the priests. You have destroyed the healing pool. The two of you will pay for what you have done. You fools. You have no idea what suffering you have caused. The hooded figure in the middle was speaking, I realized. I'm glad we destroyed it, I said. It took my Uncle Dan, replaced him with an imposter. How do you know your Uncle Dan wasn't happy where he was down there? We could see inside his mind, you know. We could dig and root around to find his deepest, darkest desires. And we fulfilled them. He got to live his dreams down there at the bottom of the lake, and you killed him. You robbed him of his dreams. The figure spoke with assurance, but I knew he was wrong. 
My uncle wouldn't have wanted to live like that. I saw how he was down there. I was probably the only one in the world this line of bullshit wasn't going to work on. Fuck you and your death plants. I'm glad they got a taste of their own medicine. I looked him dead in the eye as I said this. Oh, don't worry, the man in the middle said. There are plenty of other healing pools. We've got franchises set up everywhere. He tittered at this, and the man and woman standing on either side of him laughed as well. They chuckled and giggled and pointed at us. Their hands were made of vines, I saw. The vines grew and came towards us rapidly before we could do anything. They wrapped around us, and I felt them ensnare me, squeezing the air from my lungs. The world slowly turned from red to black as I lost consciousness. I woke up, I don't know how much later. Bill came awake beside me a few moments after. I looked around in wonderment and terror. My phone was still in my pocket and had signal. I tried to dial 911, but it wouldn't let me call out. None of my apps would work. Nothing except for this. There was a piece of paper folded up on the ground in front of me, and I picked it up. Greetings, it read. As you know, the church frowns upon killing people, so we've devised an alternative way of dealing with miscreants such as yourselves. We let you live the rest of your lives in a labyrinth. Feel free to tell your friends online about it. They won't believe you, of course. The letter was signed at the bottom. I tried to take a picture, but my phone wouldn't let me. There was a distinctive letterhead with a religious symbol at the top. Your friends from church, it said at the bottom of the page. I looked around and saw the walls were sheer and impossible to climb. Tall hedges over 20 feet tall towered over us. Brightly colored snakes and spiders could be seen dotting the foliage here and there, and I suspected this place would not be friendly to visitors. Bill was looking pale and sickly. Hey man, I said. Come on, it's not so bad. At least we've got our health. He turned his head and I winced when I saw the deep gash there again, now starting to look mildly red and infected. He tried to stand up and almost collapsed on his bad leg. Oh, right. The shrapnel, I thought to myself. Yeah, he said, rolling his pale blue eyes. I drink to that. Am I ever thirsty? It didn't take long to realize that the hedge maze labyrinth we were in was massive. The bushes which blocked our way to either side were over 20 feet high. Their branches were thin and too weak to climb, yet the foliage was so thick it was impossible to go through. The only choice was to go forward. A note had been left for us telling us that we were trapped here, doomed to wander this maze for who knew how long. My only companion was Bill, an unusual gentleman I had met on Reddit, who I was beginning to distrust more and more. I couldn't remember if his eyes were that light shade of pale blue before. That was a sign that one had been replaced by the pod people. We had encountered them in the cave as we tried to escape after poisoning the pool where the plant creatures made their home. It was entirely possible they had replaced Bill with an imposter. But to what end? Except just to fuck with me. Which was entirely possible. You know I can read your posts on No Sleep, right? Bill asked from behind me. I'm not a fucking pod person, asshole. Right, I forgot about that. It seemed he still had his phone as well, and it had signal and was well charged. Too bad it seemed he was confined to the pages of Reddit as well on his device, unable to reach out for help. Someone would eventually notice we were missing, I hoped. I'd really like to believe you, Bill, but how do I know for sure? A thought occurred to me. Wait a minute. I stopped him and looked him straight in his icy blue eyes. Say ah, uh, I said, miming a doctor. Oh, fuck this, he said, walking away. Come on, Bill. I hurried up to catch up with him and grabbed his arm. 
Just do it, okay? It'll put my mind at ease. I'll do it too, see? Ah. Uh... I held my mouth open for a few seconds and he nodded. Okay, fine. Look. Ah. Uh... See? Happy now? No vine tongue. His teeth were coffee-stained, and I could see a few were partially replaced with silver fillings. He was a normal person. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Now we know we're both who we say we are. I never doubted you, you paranoid son of a bitch, he said to me, a little bitter at my investigations. I decided to let that slide and kept walking along the path through the maze. We still hadn't come to an intersection yet. I looked up and saw a high canopy of jungle trees above us, and I wondered where we were. South America, perhaps? Africa or Australia? I could hear monkeys in the trees and birds of a thousand species cawing and squawking above us. Finally, we came upon a crossroads. There were two choices, left or right. Well, which way is it going to be? Bill asked. Neither route looked more inviting. They almost looked identical, except for the red flowers dotting the bushes here and there on the path to the right. Red flowers, I said. I wonder if that means something. Red can mean poison, right? It can mean a lot of things, Bill said vaguely. But yeah, my guts say let's avoid those red flowers. Stick with the regular shrubs. The devil you know is better than the one you don't, right? Is that how that one goes? You're the writer. Alright, let's go to the left. I hope we're right about this. We went down the path to the left, and it stretched on for a long while. There was the occasional turn, but mostly we were just walking down straight, perfectly manicured stretches of bushes. Somebody must cut these things, I said, realizing how perfectly the hedges were trimmed. They'd have to be out here all the time, though. There's so many of them. So where are the gardeners? I couldn't help but wonder if this was the vast hedge maze of some lunatic billionaire. A wealthy theocrat made rich from the donations of poor people to the church. Just as I was wondering about gardeners, we heard the sound of a chainsaw up ahead. Finally, someone who could tell us how to get the hell out of here. I burst into a run, not really thinking about the potential dangers of the situation anymore, as much as I should have. Bill called after me, but I ignored him. He tried to catch up, his beer gut swaying back and forth as he ran. Hold on, we still don't know who that is. I was around the corner as he finished yelling. I still didn't totally trust him. What if he just wanted to stop me from getting out of here? A very tall man, nearly seven feet, dressed in black, stood in the distance ahead of me. He was holding a running chainsaw and facing away from me. He didn't seem to be doing any sort of trimming. The giant machine he held was bigger than any chainsaw I had seen before, and it matched his stature. The blade was whirring loudly and appeared to be over three feet long. Although there was no way he could have heard me over the noise it was making... He turned around instinctively as I approached. His face had no skin, I saw as his jaundiced eyes met mine. It was all muscle, and I couldn't help but observe that there were worms living within it. Little white worms like maggots. He grinned at me from his lofty height. As he faced me, I saw his black clothing was that of an undertaker. The hands that held the chainsaw were also lacking flesh and worms shone white from within them as they flexed and gripped the handle of the heavy gardening tool. He smiled at me then and spoke. I heard him well over the ripping roar of the chainsaw, despite the fact that he was still a ways away. He didn't yell, and yet his voice seemed to resonate inside my head like my own thoughts. More visitors! What fun! Back to the red roses you go, little ones. Take care not to breathe too deeply from their petals. Oh, what games we shall play. His voice was rasping and manic, full of excited energy and morbid joy. He stalked towards us and we turned and ran in terror. The chainsaw roared as he called after us. Come back, little ones. Daddy Worms wants to see you. 
You can't run forever, but I can walk all day. <laughs> he tittered, and I looked back to see he was indeed walking, his long legs taking him a great distance with each stride he took. Even running at a full sprint, we barely gained any distance between us and him. Run. Back to the flower path. We'll have to take our chances. Don't breathe in too deeply, he said. You trust that fucking freak? Bill yelled at me as he ran. I didn't bother answering, but I had a feeling the giant undertaker with the chainsaw was telling the truth. After all, he was the gardener. Gardeners know flowers, right? We got back to the path and broke off the other way towards the red flowers, which grew more plentiful as we ran. I looked back in terror and saw that the muscly, fleshless, freakishly tall gardener was still not far back. He was walking the same steady pace, his long legs taking him far with each step. He carried the chainsaw effortlessly and grinned with a mouth full of long, wide buck teeth, like a joker on a playing card. Come back to me, friends. I have a game I like to play with newcomers. It's called Cut Your Fucking Throats! <laughs> I held up my shirt over my nose, noticing the red flowers were easily disturbed and seemed to be releasing a pollen-like substance into the air. The powdery dust rose up around us as we ran. Cover your face! I yelled to Bill. He pulled his shirt up over his nose. I realized I was getting the worst of it running behind him. I was starting to feel itchy. I looked down at my hands and saw they were red. White heads and blisters began to sprout like mushrooms in a time-lapse animation on my arms and hands. I looked up ahead and saw we were going to be past the red flowers pretty soon. It was a good thing, too. My skin felt like it was on fire. I wanted to itch it so badly, but I had a feeling that was a very bad idea. Oh, fuck, this place sucks. I shouted up to Bill. He turned around and I saw his face was covered in white blisters as well, and a spreading, angry-looking rash that matched his facial expression. No shit, he said, still running at a steady clip. Now how the hell are we going to get out of here? Bill and I ran for what felt like hours. The sound of the roaring chainsaw eventually faded into the distance, and we made another turn unobserved by Daddy Worms. What kind of crazy fucking name was that anyways, I thought. Still, it seemed to suit him. A seven-foot-tall, fleshless freak dressed as an undertaker with worms crawling around on his complexion. Yeah, that's about right, I thought. The sound died out and was soon barely audible. The red flowers had caused us to break out into rashes and painful blisters, but at least the seven-foot-tall, skinless, chainsaw-wielding Undertaker was now nowhere to be seen. I had a feeling he had friends, though. This place was too huge, too impossibly massive for one man to take care of by himself. Maybe he wasn't a man at all, though, a voice in my head said. Maybe this whole place isn't real, or isn't really what it seems. I wiped sweat from my forehead and tried to catch my breath in the sweltering heat. It had been brisk and cool in the morning, but now the air had become oppressive and thick with jungle moisture. We stopped to catch our breath and waited for the inevitable sound of the chainsaw to come around the corner. But it never came. It appeared we had lost him. I think he's gone, Bill said in between coughing and wheezing. Thank God I quit smoking 20 years ago. Not that it matters now. He looked defeated and exhausted as he put his back to the hedge and eased himself down to sit on the ground. I noticed he was trembling all over. Come on, Bill, I said. We're going to get out of here, okay? I need you, man. Don't give up on me now. Kid, I ain't giving up. Just give me a minute, will ya? This heat, it's like a sauna in here. His breath was starting to sound wheezy, and his lungs were crackling like Rice Krispies. Bill, did you hold your breath when we ran past those flowers? They were putting off some kind of gas or pollen, it looked like. I don't know, I tried. He broke into a hacking cough, and I saw his hand come away from his mouth covered in blood. 
I had covered my face with my shirt and it had provided some small protection. I had held my breath, but he hadn't done the same. Bill was looking not so good suddenly. His face became pale and gray as he coughed and struggled to breathe. Come on, Bill, we gotta keep moving. He'll have figured out which way we ran by now. He'll be backtracking to find us. I helped Bill to his feet and pulled him away down the long path, leading to the next turn. I saw we had two choices, left or right. What do you think, man? Which way? I looked at Bill, but he was looking more and more weak, his breath sounding worse every second. He didn't even respond. I put his arm over my shoulder and led him down the path to the right. It led in the direction away from Daddy Worms, and I thought that was safest. We kept walking along the path, and Bill grew weaker and weaker. His breathing became rapid and shallow, each inhalation punctuated by raspy wheezes and a bubbling croup. I saw what looked like a Venus flytrap to my left, but larger. It was so unusual, I leaned in for a look, and the thing jumped out at me from the wall, its mouth full of razor-sharp teeth, snapping at me like a rabid dog. I actually took a piece out of my cheek with a rough and jagged bite like broken glass scraping against my face. I recoiled and screamed, but Bill barely flinched. He looked ready to collapse. I felt warm blood trickling down my neck. Suddenly I heard the chainsaw revving behind us once again. I looked back and saw the tall undertaker with his three-foot-long chainsaw blade stalking slowly and steadily towards us. His black eyes met mine, and he broke into a wide grin. Hello, friends. Daddy Worms has found you. His long strides were quickly closing the distance between us. Go, kid. Bill looked at me with red and weeping eyes. His mouth was hanging open and he looked defeated. I remembered back to when I had first met him at the coffee shop. He looked so strong and intense. His resolve and determination it had taken us all the way to our goal. We had destroyed the healing spring and set things right. At least... I wanted to believe we did. Now he was on the verge of death and I couldn't help but feel responsible. Just go. You can't help me anymore. I'll just slow you down and get us both killed. Go! He's almost here! I looked up and saw he was right. The impossibly tall, chainsaw-wielding maniac was almost upon us. I stood and looked down with the worst guilt I had ever felt in my life. This man was going to die, and I was indirectly responsible for it. My eyes flooded with sudden tears. Go! Run! There's no sense both of us dying. He broke off into a hacking cough as blood poured from his mouth and nose. I ran. The sound of a familiar voice screaming in the distance behind me gradually faded, and then was silent in an instant. I ran and ran and ran. I lost track of the twists and turns after going down one random path after another. They all looked the same, but the horrors were fresh and new with each hedge I ran past. I learned quickly not to stray too far from the center of the pathway. Poisonous mushrooms that spit toxic brown clouds in one area. Another had lizards that would hiss and whip their long tails as you passed leaving long red marks and lacerations. Yet another was filled with rose bushes whose thorns snuck into the center of the path, nearly invisibly, so that I was a bloody mess after passing through the tangled, thorny vines there. I came to another section filled with snakes, that were striped with bright red, black, and yellow bands. I couldn't go that way. I just couldn't. I hate snakes. I turned around and made my way back to the last fork in the road and hoped the other way was safer. That way took me to a tunnel. It was an open doorway covered in ivy and steps leading down. This is different, I thought. The darkness swallowed me whole as I made my way down earthen stairs, which took me to a root-laden dirt cellar space. It stretched into the distance a long ways before being absorbed in darkness. I realized my phone had no signal there down beneath the earth, but it felt right. 
It felt like perhaps the way out. I had no way of knowing. The lack of light was disconcerting, but I decided it was worth a shot. I backtracked and walked up the stairs into the sunshine to post this. I'm sending this out into the ether. For all I know, it might be the last you will ever hear from me. The steps ahead beckon me onwards. Into the depths and into the darkness. If I make it out, I'll let you know. Wish me luck. I walked through the cold dirt tunnels beneath the hedge maze for hours. It was dark, but I eventually came across a lone torch, blazing in the pitch darkness. Strange, I thought. It was like someone had lit it and left it for me to find. I pulled the torch from its spot on the wall and proceeded forward, now with a flame to light my path. The dirt tunnel was low overhead with roots that came down and brushed against my hair. The worms and bugs that resided up there fell down occasionally, squirming and scampering across my skin until I brushed them away. Terror overtook me at a certain point and as I lost all sense of direction and became absorbed in the darkness. I had no idea where I was going and it frightened me to no end. I've always been a person who needs a purpose, a goal, something to fight for to go forward. I didn't have that for a little while. My family and friends' memories were lost to that empty darkness of the tunnel. At my lowest point, the torch flame guttering and dying with a hiss. I tried to lift my own spirit somehow. I had just been plunged into darkness once again and my fear ignited anew, as I had no idea what else could be around me down there. Probably a minotaur, for all I know, I thought to myself. That's where they were supposed to live, after all. In a labyrinth. My days of reading through classical Greek mythology, a secret high school obsession, came back to me suddenly. That's when I remembered something. You weren't supposed to try and escape a labyrinth. That wasn't the point. I needed to get to the middle of the thing. And it wasn't like a maze where there was more than one way to get to the finish line. No, in a labyrinth there's only one path, only one way. The torch had been left for me. A sign, perhaps? A token of goodwill? Had I made it this far and been correct somehow? It felt right. Like the voice in my head that was telling me at each narrow corner now, left, right, left, right. I'd been hearing it all along. But it just assumed I was making random turns and it was my own mind speaking to me. But perhaps it had been something more than that all along. You've gotten further than any before, a voice said in the darkness. I nearly jumped out of my skin, trembling with fear. But the voice said nothing more than that. I heard footsteps disappearing into the darkness and walked in that direction, not knowing where else to go. A while later, I had another choice to make. Left, said the voice in my head. So I went left. After that, it told me which way to go again and again and again. It sounded clearer every time. It wasn't the same voice as I had heard in the darkness, though. This one was very clearly coming from within my own skull. I didn't understand it, but I had no better option than to follow it. Maybe it was my gut, my intuition... I had always been lucky over the years. In elementary school, I would win the raffles and the cakes at the bake sales. I'd enter 50-50 draws at stag and doe parties and even huge stadiums and would win. It was like I was destined to succeed in things sometimes. People would say I had the luck of an Irishman, but my family wasn't Irish. The air became cooler as I walked into the depths of the buried maze. My hands were shivering when I finally saw light up ahead once again. Another torch. I picked it up and continued on. The dark tunnel would branch off into two or three different directions occasionally, and according to my theory, only one was ever right. That was if I wanted to get to the center, the middle of the labyrinth. A noise from up ahead drew my attention and I quickened my pace. 
I was not hungry or thirsty despite walking for countless hours. My body felt like it no longer existed. It seemed as if I was outside of it, no longer capable of weakness or hunger or pain or death. But fear was not a thing altogether. My terror stayed with me and kept me company as I walked on for hours until my torch began to gutter and die out once again, plunging me into blackness. In the darkness, I saw something up ahead. A bit of light dancing on the dirt walls of the tunnel. Another torch, perhaps, I thought. But no. This was different. As I got closer, I realized it was the doorway to a great room with candles and torchlight dancing from within. I entered on trembling legs. At the center of the chamber was a throne where a huge creature sat. He held a trident and his head was that of a bull. His body resembled a man, although I saw he also had a tail. His voice was thunder when he spoke. You have reached the center. I was worried he might stab me with his trident, but he didn't. He just stood there and stared at me. Most try to escape. They wander aimlessly forever at the peripheries, trying to get back onto the path. But they never will, right? That's how it works. You take one wrong turn and you're lost forever. To the flowers and the thorns, Mr. Worms and the mushroom gas and banded snakes. Who are you people, anyway? Why are you doing this? I warn you. You may have one request. Be careful if you wish to ask for this or something else. I realized what he was saying. That he would let me go if I only asked for it. But he was a genie who granted only one wish. I could go home. I could be free if I wanted to be. But that would mean never knowing the truth, never knowing why any of this had happened. Bill, his cousin, my Uncle Dan, so many countless others would have died for nothing. But on the other hand, what could I do? Was there any real way to get to the bottom of all this? I was afraid to ask any other questions. It seemed I would have only one chance. I thought for a long while before making my decision. Then spoke the words carefully and deliberately. I want to be back home safely with my family. I said. It was the only thing that made any sense. The safest and best option. He rose from his throne and dust fell from the ceiling as he stomped loudly across the packed dirt floor towards me. As he approached, the ground opened up before him. A twisting vortex with roots and worms floating upwards from it. The hole within was eternity. Step inside my office, he said as the dirt tornado flew into my eyes and stung them. It will take you home. It will bring you back to your family. I stepped my foot into the hole and fell down into the dirt. It sucked me down and pulled me into it greedily like quicksand. Dirt was on my face and all around me as I clawed my way through it, desperate for air. The earth was in my mouth and in my nose, suffocating me. I tore and raked at it with my hands and made muffled screams into the wet soil all around me. Just as I felt as if I would no longer last another second in the black dirt that had entombed me, I grasped fresh air with my fingers and grass and pulled myself up into the air above, taking great heaving breaths. I looked around and saw I was in my own backyard. My home was right in front of me. I had been buried alive just steps from my house but had survived. It seemed the Minotaur wanted one last laugh after all. He had known my mind, it seemed to me. Had been able to see inside my thoughts and my one worst fear. I looked back and saw a gravestone was there just at the head of my now disrupted burial site. Next to the tombstones marking the adjacent graves of all my other 
newly deceased family members. Here lies Jason, it read. May he rest in peace. Beloved by his family, even though he was always so damn bullheaded. I rolled my eyes. Fucking demigods always have to have the last laugh. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zawal, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamakato, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. And if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you, which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Links to join are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.